Friday, 29th of May, 1914, Blackstone HQ, Scotland. Welcome back everyone to the 39 Steps. The whole place smelt of mould and disuse. The old boy had gone off in a motor to collect the two ruffians who had interviewed me yesterday. Now they have seen me as the roadman, and they would remember me, for I was in the same rig. What was a roadman doing 20 miles from his beat, pursued by the police? A question or two would put them on the track. Probably they had seen Mr Turnbull, probably Marmy too. Most likely they could link me up with Sir Harry, and then the whole thing would be crystal clear. The more I thought about it, the angrier I grew, and I had to get up and move about the room. Windows are locked. That one too? Yeah, that one too. What's we got here? What's this? Couldn't open the boxes. Okay. Still couldn't open the boxes. The door? Found the handle in the wall which seems worth investigating. What do we have here? We have some... is this wire? We've taken that, whatever that was. Torch? Whatever that is. Taking some bric a brac and a box. I've got all the four things I needed apparently. Opening this box up, what's in here? What is that? Oh, it's that stuff you put dried flowers in, isn't it? Maybe not. It was lentonite, a powerful explosive. Most definitely not what you put dried flowers in. A powerful explosive I knew from my time as a mining engineer. But I've forgotten the proper charge and the right way of preparing it, and I wasn't sure about the timing. I had only a vague notion too as to its power, for though I had used it I had not handled it with my own fingers. But it was a chance, the only possible chance. The remembrance of little Scudder decided me. Let's rig the explosives. God, here we go. Oh god, I almost got it wrong. Well, I did get it wrong. Place it by the door. It was about the beastliest moment of my life, for I'm no good at these cold-blooded resolutions. Still, I managed to rake up and pluck to set my teeth and choke back the horrid doubts that flooded into me. I simply shut off my mind and pretended I was doing an experiment. As simple as Guy Fawkes' fireworks. Kaboom? Wow. Well, it worked. Let's go. At much haste. <coughs> My stupor can scarcely have lasted beyond a few seconds. I stepped over the broken lintel and found myself standing in a yard in a dense and acrid fog. I felt very sick and ill, but I could move my limbs and I staggered blindly forward away from the house.
a small mill lathe ran in the wooden aqueduct at the other side of the yard. I fell into this. The coal water revived me and I had just enough wits left to think of an escape. I squirmed up the lathe among the slippery green slime till I reached the mill wheel. Then I wriggled through the axle hole into the old mill and tumbled on to a bed of chaff. A nail caught the seat of my trousers and I felt the wisp of heather mixture behind me. Nausea shook me and the wheel in my head kept turning while my left shoulder and arm screamed to be stricken with, the, with palsy. I crawled down the broken ladder, scattering chaff behind me to cover my footsteps. I did the same on the mill floor and on the threshold where the door hung on broken hinges. I slipped across the space, got to the back of a dovecot and prospected a way of ascent. By the use of out jutting stones, gaps in the masonry and a tough ivy root, I got to the top. I found space to lie down. Then I proceeded to go off into an old fashioned swoon. Downward Spiral Saturday, 30th of May 1914, Blackstone HQ, Scotland. I woke with a burning head and the sun glaring in my face. For a long time I lay motionless, for those horrible fumes seemed to have loosened my joints and dulled my brain. There was a little gap in the parapet to which I wriggled and from which I had some sort of prospect of the yard. I saw figures come out, a servant with his head bound up, and then a younger man in knickerbockers. I saw the rotund figure of my late captor, and I thought I made out the man with the lisp. I noticed that all had pistols. They were looking for something, and moved towards the mill. For half an hour they ransacked the mill. Then they came outside and stood just below the dovecot, arguing fiercely. I heard them fiddling with the door of the dovecot, and for one horrid moment I fancied they were coming up. Then they thought better of it and went back to the house. All that long blistering afternoon I lay baking on the rooftop. Thirst was my chief torment. My tongue was like a stick. I watched the course of the little stream as it came in from the moor. I would have given a thousand pounds to plunge my face into that. I saw the car speed away with two occupants and a man on a hill pony riding east. I wished them joy of their quest. If that aeroplane came back, the chances were 10 to 1 I would have been discovered. So through the afternoon I lay and prayed for the coming of darkness. 
on the dovecot. Health. My shoulder was in a bad way. At first I thought it was only a bruise, but it seemed to be swelling, and I had no use for my left arm. I had a crushing headache, and I felt as sick as a cat. Those lentonite fumes had fairly poisoned me, and the baking hours of the dovecot hadn't helped matters. Appearance. I had neither coat, waistcoat, collar, nor hat. My trousers were badly torn, and my face and hands were blacked with the explosion. I dare say I had other beauties, for my eyes felt as if they were furiously bloodshot. Escape. It seemed to me that sooner I got in touch with the Foreign Office man, Sir Walter Bullivant, the better. He must just take or leave my story. And anyway, with him I would be in better hands than those devilish Germans. I had begun to feel quite kindly towards the British police. My plan was to seek Mr Turnbull's cottage, recover my garments, especially Scudder's notebook, then make for the main line and get back to the south. Thank God it was a black night. My thirst was too great to allow me to tarry, so about 9 o'clock, so far as I could judge, I started to descend. Halfway down I heard the back door of the house open, and saw the gleam of a lantern against the, the mill wall. For some agonising minutes I hung by the ivy and prayed that whoever it was would not come around the dovecot. Then the light disappeared and I dropped as softly as I could onto the hard soil of the yard. I crawled on my belly in the lee of the stone dyke till I reached the fringes of the trees which surrounded the house. I was in a pretty bad way. Ten minutes later my face was in the spring and I was soaking down pints of blessed water. But I did not stop till I had put half a dozen miles between me and that accursed dwelling. I sat down and took stock of my position. Sir Harry's map had given me the lie of the land. All I had to do was to steer a point or two west of southwest to come to the stream where I had met the roadman. I calculated I must be on about 18 miles distant, and that meant I could not get there before morning. Very soon after daybreak, I made an attempt to clean myself in a hill burn, and then approached a herd's cottage, for I was feeling the need for food. What in the name of... What's happened to you? Forgive me. I've taken a pretty bad fall. Come in. Come in. The herd's wife, first impressions. She was a decent old body. Sorry, let me read that. She was a decent, I got it right. She was a decent old body with a plucky one. And a plucky one. For though she got a fright when she saw me, she had an axe handy and would have used it on an, any evil doer. I don't know what she took me for. A repentant burglar, perhaps. Samaritan. Like a true Samaritan, she asked no questions, but gave me a bowl of milk with a dash of whiskey in it, and let me sit for a little in her kitchen fire. By her kitchen fire, not in her kitchen fire. She would have bathed my shoulder, but it ached so badly that I would not let her touch it. She 
She showed me how to wrap the plaid around my shoulders, and when I left the cottage, I was the living image of the kind of Scotsman you see in the illustrations to Burns' poems. Please, take this as payment for your hospitality. No, no. Keep your cellar. No! Give it to them that he erected it. Oh, erect then, if you insist. Tack my plead and, oh, this old heart that belonged to my man. I passed over the miseries of that night among the wet hills. Twice I lost my way and I had some nasty fools into pea box. I had only about 10 miles to go as the crow flies, but my mistakes made it nearly 20, nearer 20. The last bit was completed with set teeth and a very light and dizzy head. But I managed it, and in the early dawn I was knocking at Mr. Turnbull's door. Who are ye that comes stravagin here in the <sighs> Sabbath morning? My head was swimming so wildly that I could not frame a coherent answer, but he recognised me. Ah, hey, have you got my specs? I fetched them out of my trouser pocket. You'll have come for your jacket and waistcoat. Come on, boy. Wash, man, you're terrible doing to the legs. Oh, up till I get you to a cheer. I had a good deal of fever in my bones, and the wet night had brought it out, while my shoulder and the effects of the fumes combined to make me feel pretty bad. I perceived I was in for a bout of malaria. Before I knew, Mr Turnbull was helping me off with my clothes, and put me into bed in one of the two cupboards that lined the kitchen walls. He was a true friend in need, that old roadman. <laughs> <laughs> 